Hey everyone, welcome back to Epicenter Garage. We've got a busy day today. So, well, when I say busy, I mean basically kind of shoving around paperwork. So today we're gonna to do a couple different things. One, is I finally, it's that time of the year for me, and I have to, I went down to the tag office. It took me four tries, it's so longer than it normally takes me, but that's what happens when you have oh my, probably 70 cars to tag. So anyway, we got all the cars, updated registrations, updated tags. and I've, So anyway, we're going to be going around putting all the tags or at least dropping registrations into cars. But what I'm really excited about, I've got like six or seven cars, maybe eight cars that are now eligible or now I can run antique tags on. So there are 86 or 87, I can't remember. So, but anyway, got quite a few of those. So I'm I know it's kind of crazy to be able to get excited about being able to put a white or a solid white antique tag on a car, but, but I am. So I, I can't wait. Like the 86 Turbo over there, it gets an antique tag. The 87 down here, it gets an antique tag. Oh man, I, I won't know until I see them. But anyway, we've got a whole stack and then we've got to go through and drop registrations in. And so I've got, luckily, you know, honestly, a lot of times people always ask me how expensive it is to tag all my cars in it. It is. I'm, I'm very fortunate that you know, um, I can tag all these cars, but at the same time, it's not too bad. A lot of my cars are antique, and so it usually runs you know, $30, $40 a car, roughly right around there, maybe 20, 30, maybe, I think they're $29 for an antique tag. So it's not too bad. That's, that's one reason why I get really excited about when some of my cars drop into the antique realm. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm shifting gears here. So the other things we've got to do is we've got the Oh, we finished the change of the oil on the green RSR, and so we're going to back that out. We got the br brakes bled, and so I'm, I hadn't changed the oil on that. I hate to admit it for like two years, but I hadn't driven it for a, for a while. So I guess I get a little pass on that. So anyway, finally got the oil changed on that, so we're going to pull that out and go have some fun with that car. I cannot wait to get it back in that car. because And I tuned on the carbs a little bit. I'm going to pull it out and make sure they're okay. Um, the jets were a little bit clogged. Last time I did drive, it was probably... Oh boy, probably about two months ago. And so I could tell one of the jets was, it, it seemed like on the left bank was plugged a little bit. So anyway, we're gonna double check that. I think I got that set. So we're gonna pull that out. We're gonna pull some of these other cars out. And then also we've got, you probably noticed the 917 sitting in the corner, the Kraftworks 917. I wish it was real, but it's not. Um, but anyway, we're gonna go over that car a little bit because I finally got, that car's been sitting over there in the corner for a little bit because I need to rebuild. This got, car's got 50 PMOs on it. And so we're in the process, or I'm in the process of rebuilding the carburetors on that. So I've been waiting on the rebuild kit for the PMOs. So it has arrived. And I also got a couple synchronizers because we've got to dial that in. I'm gonna take you through that process, not today, but in a future episode, I'll take you through that process of dialing both banks in on a flat six engine. And a shout out to my wife. We celebrated our 22nd anniversary the other day. And you know, you guys out there have been married for a long time. You get to a certain point where you just know each other so well. And what did she get me? A slot car and, and some socks, which is honestly, that's exactly what I needed. I needed both. So anyway, an awesome Skelectric slot car. And she even realized one that I don't have, which is, which is awesome. So you can't beat that. So I love her. Anyway, so what we're going to do is let's go around and put at least all the uh, ones that are vintage now, or antique, I should say. So come with me, and we're going to put some on the cars. So I was jumping around, handling all the antiques, but that's taken way too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start right here and work my way on down the line. So right here we've got 19, or excuse me, 2005 Subaru Impreza. All the paperwork. Got our new sticker here. And you know what? I've got the plate in here because this car, this is going to be on a future episode as well because this is a 1989 911, the last year of the G-body cars. So it's got the 3.2 in it with the G50 transmission, which I love the G50 transmission, the best, best tra Porsche transmission ever. And so anyway, I bought this a long time ago. And it's a little bit rough around the edge, as you can see here. It's got some paint. All the seals are going, kind of going bad. Tan interior, but it's got 160,000 miles on it. It's, it runs kind of rough. The interior is pretty much shot. 
Um, so anyway, I'm not going to turn this into a race car. I'm going to completely restore this car back original the way, the way you guys see it here, but much nicer, or at least is, is a little nicer than it is now. So I bought my very first Chevrolet. And for whatever reason, I've never, I've never owned a Chevrolet. And I mean, I've, I've loved Corvettes, but I just, I don't know. I just never bought one before. So this one, I had a good friend call me up and say, hey, Brian, are you interested in a 2003 Z06? And I'm, yeah, I mean, no matter what, I'm interested in any car pretty much. So anyway, this gentleman here actually in my county had this yellow 2003 and actually he was, I don't know, tired of it. He was uh, wanting to have something a little different toy, different toy to play with or something like that. So anyway, he wanted to sell it. So it's got, I think it's 17,000 miles. So I went and drove it, checked it out. And I had never driven this year a, a C5 Z06. And oh man, they're such good cars. I'm I mean, had I driven one a lot longer or earlier, I, I would have bought one. But anyway, so fi I bought this car and finally got the tag for it. So, because I, I wanted to take this car out and drive it because I didn't get a 30-day tag because obviously I purchased it from an individual. So now that I've got it tagged, uh, I, can't, I can't wait to take this thing out and, and have some fun with it. So the next car, 1988 911. This one, this is my, I'll tell you a little bit about this car, I guess. So this is a 1988 911 Carrera with a 3.2 G50 gearbox as well. So I bought this one, it had a lot of miles on it. Bought this one a long time ago with the, the full intent to backdate it. So I did, I went ahead and backdated this to make it look like a 73 Carrera RS. So you kind of get all of the, the, the new features of a, of a 3.2 Carrera but it has, you know, it plays the part. So a lot of people kind of sometimes look down on backdating cars and I, I love backdated cars. Cause I mean, now granted, I mean, would I love to own a real 73 Carrera? Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not a fool, but this to me, you know, I love the look of the careers and the, what are the new, I mean, what are career RSs now? They're I mean, they shot up and then they kind of dropped back down, but I think they've come back up, you know, for a, what, 800,000, 750 to 800, depending on overall condition. So, you know, there's just something about, you know, taking a 911 and kind of putting your own touches on it. Granted, you know, it looks like a 73 Carrera, but, you know, so, but the interior, I kind of changed the interior around a little bit. Um, so it is what it is, but I, oh, I, I really like driving this car. Different exhaust on it. Still has a stock 3.2, but it does have a Steve Wong uh, chip in it. So it does produce a little bit more power. I would guess it's probably 230 horsepower, somewhere right around there. All right, so we finally got all the tags. Well, most all the tags. I've got two cars that are not here, and so we'll have to put those tags on when the cars come back. So. Now you may have remembered we were working on this car, putting it up on the lift, so it is completely done. We got the oil changed, we got the brakes flushed, so I got all of that stuff done. And then of course I was doing a nut and bolt check, because this is, this is basically it's a race car, it's built for vintage racing. So the biggest thing you always wanna do on cars like this is do nut and bolt checks. And so we had it up on the lift, went through all the suspension mounts, everything, made sure everything was tight. We remarked everything as well with a paint marker, just to make sure you can kind of glance to make sure none of the bolts have, have moved that's the reason why you use paint markers on your bolts and things like that so anyway it is ready to go the only thing we need to do is we need to get it out of here and get it up to temperature because on this car as you guys come around here I'll show you see it's a little bit different the front is obviously different than your typical 911 granted this is this is set up for vintage racing so what we have here is we have a 12 gallon race tank um, and of course the fill neck actually protrudes through the hood and I'll show you here just like that. That way, in race, you can come in, fly into the pits. You guys, that men and women out there that know race cars, you know, that's, that's probably nothing special. But anyway, so you can fill directly through the hood um, in a vintage enduro race. And so, got our oil cooler up front. You can see what we basically do on these cars is we actually cut the front of these cars and put an air relief, I guess you would say. And so the oil cooler is in the front, so the, oil, the air comes in the front. 
actually the air has a place to go and actually goes down under the car. Now, some guys, some people actually build it so the air actually comes around the side. Um, but this one, we wanted to keep it pretty simple so the air just drives back or, or flows back underneath the car. So here we have our fuel pump down in the corner down here. We have our fuel filter. We have our fire bottle here. We have oil overflow here as well. And then we have our main oil tank here. And this is, I don't know how many gallon this is, but it, it holds a lot of oil. So basically on the bottom of this car, you drain oil in three different spots. I have, a dr I have a drain here at the front oil cooler. So we drain it there. We also drain it at the bottom of our overflow tank here. And then we also drain it at the back at the engine as well. So, but this is where we actually fill all of the oil. So this usually holds about nine, 10 quarts. And so, but what I always do is we have our oil gauge here, clean that off. And we actually dip that down into the tank. And of course, usually when it's cold, the oil comes up to the first hole here. And then once it's warm, it comes up to the top hole. So what we've got to do is we've got to fire this up, pull it out, put it on level ground, and then we'll let the temperature, we'll let it idle for probably about five minutes, let all the oil get up to temp. We'll dip the, dip the uh, oil dipstick in and check the level, and then we'll add some oil accordingly. So the first couple episodes, when we were talking about cars, we're showing maintenance, and we're always going to do that, show you what it takes to maintain, oh man, I don't even know, probably 60 or 70 cars in, uh, in my collection. So we're gonna take you through that process and continue to do that. But the real fun, for me anyway, and hopefully for you guys, I mean, hopefully you guys have enjoyed, enjoyed them so far, but it's gonna take them out, mountain cameras all over the cars. Now, I know we did that in the GTR. We kind of did a little ride along, but that was just to make sure we, we eliminated that, that, that little uh, hiccup between 2,500 and 3,000 RPM, which is still good, which is, which is awesome. So, but oh, cars like this, especially race cars on the street. Oh my gosh. That's what really gets me going. That, oh, that, that just really, that's what it's all about for me. So we're going to fire this thing up and take it out for a couple, uh, a couple of laps around the neighborhood or maybe on the highway. So let's get this thing backed up and done. <laughs> So we have three switches here. We actually ha we have the ignition switch here. We have the fuel the primes are actually runs the fuel pump and then we have the starter. So basically what I'm going to do, let me hit the power. We let it crank over. And now we are good to go. So we're going to go ahead and ignition fuel, let the tack run up, come back down. Prime it just a bit. There we go. There we go.
that was fun. Very wet, but awesome. Oh, man. Whew. Oh, man. Ah. Well, it runs fantastic. I wasn't able to, like, really get on it hard in second gear because it was just, it was just getting squirrely and would, we'd get the tires spinning a little bit, but man, it's running really good. I need to lean out the carbs just a little bit. The transition is just from about 2000, a little over 2000 RPM to about probably 2,500. It hesitates just a little bit. And, but boy, whew, once you hit four grand, 4,500, it just, it just launches. So, but we're going to check it out a little bit and make sure everything is no runs, no leaks. I think we're all good. And you can see here, these are called the, the hats. And so this allows the water to not go down in the carbs because you can see here, especially on a race car, you don't have the seals and all that kind of stuff to keep, keep water out. So these are the hats that keep it from uh, getting down in the carbs, but everything, everything looks good. So what I'll end up doing is I'll lean it out just a little bit uh, right here on either side, balance them a little bit more, and then it is good to go. Oh, I'm excited. All right, well, we just got done taking out the green RSR, fiddle with the carbs a little bit on that, and we got it dialed in. I think just right, there's a little more finagling I've got to do on that, but oh man, it seems like today is like a, a carburetor day for some reason. So. Anyway, I was going to bring you guys up to speed a little bit on where we're at with the, where I'm at with the Kraftworks 917. Obviously, this is not a real 917. This was built by a company called Kraftworks. And in a future episode, we're going to do a deep dive into this car to uh, kind of take you through the car, how it was built, why they were built, um, and how, how special this car is. Because it is, even though it's not a real car um, or a real 917 or a real Porsche for that matter, it is a really neat car that, um, that Andrew out of Kraftworks built and, um, and how close this is to the original cars. I'll bet obviously it doesn't have a flat 12 in it, which would be awesome if it did, but it does not. So anyway, what we're doing to this car is I pulled the carburetors off. It has 50 PMO carburetors. So they're an aftermarket carburetor. So it's not like they're a normal like Weber's or something like that on a, on a, on a, a normal flat six or Porsche engine. So the company called PMO builds, I wouldn't say, I will say it, better carburetors, more tunable carburetors, and just offers, it gives these engines a lot more horsepower. So these are 50 millimeter carburetors that were on this car. And so, but I've had them on there for a long time. The seals, the gaskets down along the bottom were starting to go bad. I was starting to get some leaks through them. So I pulled them off and I just got the kits in that I told you about earlier. And so we're gonna go ahead and rebuild the carburetors on this car. And I cannot wait to get this thing back up and running. And oh man, I really miss driving this car. So here in the next episode, couple, couple down the road, we're going to take this car out and show you what it's all about. Once again, I really appreciate you guys watching and stay tuned for future episodes.